So what is a persistent collection? Well, a persistent collection is a collection which is immutable, it can't change, but you can create cheap copies which are modified. When you have a normal non-persistent collection, like say a list, you can modify the collection, you can change what value is at its such and such index, and you can remove items, you can add items onto the end, and so forth. With a persistent list, you can have all of those same operations, except instead of modifying the list, they return a new copy of the list with the new modification. So instead of having an operation which changes a list by adding on a member to the end, you can have an operation which returns a new version of the list with all of the same content except a new member added onto the end. And the key idea here is that these copies are cheap, both in terms of time and space in memory. Normally, if I copy a list of, say, 100 items, then that means I have to do 100 individual copy operations of the individual items, which takes time and ends up using twice as much memory as I originally started with. With a persistent list, because it's immutable, there's actually no reason you would ever want to make a straight copy. If someone wants a copy of my immutable data, I just give them a pointer. I don't need to give them the actual data, because my version's never going to change, and their version's never going to change, so they're never going to diverge. They're always just going to be the same thing. But now say I want a copy of your immutable list, but I want my version to have an additional item at the end. Well, the idea of a persistent list is that we could take your version of the immutable list and produce from it a new immutable list which shares most of the data. So my new immutable list with an additional item at the end actually points to all of the original data in your list. It doesn't get its own copy. As you might imagine, the implementation of such a persistent data structure is a good bit trickier than just a normal regular linked list implementation, so I won't go into the details. Suffice it to say, Clojure has it. The most important persistent collection types in Clojure are first the linked list, which has sequential lookup times, as you should expect. And then Clojure has what it calls a vector, which is also a numerically indexed collection, but it's based on an implementation using hashing, so it has constant lookup times, or rather I should say near constant lookup times, it's actually logarithmic. And third, Clojure has what it calls a hash map, which is an associative collection made up of unordered key value pairs. So here we see three collection literals. The first on the top is a literal for a persistent list, and it's written inside parentheses, and so this has three values, one, two, and three. Notice there aren't any commas. You actually can put commas because commas in Clojure are treated actually just as white space. They're, they're just there for optional style, for clear separation if you want. On the second line is a vector literal. Vectors are written in square brackets, and here's a vector with the values one, two, and three. And on the bottom line, we see a hash map literal, which is written in curly braces, and it has the key value pair of a string foo with the value three, and a key five with the value seven. Also notice that in Clojure, a comment starts with a semicolon and runs to the end of the line. It's important to understand the difference between equality and identity. Two objects which are equal both represent the same value, that is, they have the same content. So say, two strings which are equal both represent the same sequence of characters. Two objects which are identical are not only equal, they are actually the very same object in memory. So they're not actually two objects at all, they're just one single object. In Java, the equality operator, the two equal signs, when used on primitives, does an actual equality test. So if you write three equals three, that's a true equality test. It tests whether they have the same content. However, when the Java equality operator is used on reference types, it's actually not an equality test, it's an identity test. It simply looks at the addresses of the two objects and sees if they are the same. This is mainly for the sake of efficiency. If you were to do a true equality test of two complex objects, you'd have to look at all of the respective parts and see if they match, and that can take a long time if it's a big object. Now there actually is a function in the Clojure standard library for doing identity tests, but the philosophy in Clojure is that you should favor equality tests. What makes this practical in Clojure when it's not practical in Java is that in Clojure, all of the objects, including the collections, are immutable. So what you can do then when you create, say, a big vector, is you can create a hash of that vector, and there out, whenever you need to do an equality test, you can compare the hashes of these big objects instead of actually inspecting all of their content. 
The one kind of equality test you may want to be careful about is in comparisons of strings, because a string enclosure is just a regular Java string. It's a java.lang.string. It's not any special closure string. So an equality test of strings enclosure just uses the regular Java equals method of strings. Understand, though, that the equals method in Java is really not as bad as you might assume, because, well, first of all, it's going to do an identity test, and if the strings are identical, well, then obviously they're equal. And failing that, it's actually going to do a test of their lengths, because if two strings are not the same length, then obviously they can't be equal. And only then after that is it actually going to look at the content. So the worst case scenario is actually when you're comparing two strings which are not identical, but they are equal, because then it's going to have to read through every character of both strings. And really, that's quite rare. In fact, the bigger your strings are, the less likely it is that they are equal, yet not identical. In fact, I'm having a hard time imagining any scenario in which you would be comparing strings that are thousands of characters long, and both are equal, but they're not actually the same object. In Lisp, identifiers themselves are considered a kind of value, and they're called symbols. I know this seems like an odd idea if you're not used to it, but what it simply means is that a symbol is a data type that's like a string, but whereas a string is an arbitrary sequence of any characters, a symbol is a sequence of characters where there's rules about what those characters can be. So they must follow rules like there can't be spaces, and they can't start with a number, usual identifier rules like that. Symbols, however, aren't as restrictive as identifiers in other languages. So say you can have hyphens, you can have exclamation marks, or question marks, dots, slashes, and a few other characters, plus sign, equals sign, so forth. You're probably still wondering, though, what the hell do we mean when we say a symbol is a value? Well, just like, say, a string is a value that can be an item in a collection, or that you can pass as an argument or return out of a function, well, the same thing with a symbol, it's just a kind of value. How then we distinguish between symbols serving as identifiers representing variables and symbols just representing a symbol value, well, that's a question that we'll get to. Dialects of Lisp also have a data type that's like a symbol, but it's not, and it's called a keyword. A keyword is basically a symbol, except it starts with a colon. What's the point of having keywords? Well, as you'll see, it's simply useful to have a data type which is like a symbol, but distinguishable from symbols. Metadata, as you probably know, is simply data which describes other data. In Clojure, you can attach a map as metadata to any of the Clojure types. So you can take a Clojure vector object, and you can attach a map to it which has information that describes that vector. You can't actually modify the metadata of an object. What you can do is you can take an existing object, and you can produce a new object that's just like it, but with a different metadata map attached to it. Because remember, we're dealing with immutable objects here. On the other hand, when you do an equality comparison between two objects, the metadata is ignored. So you can have two objects which are equal, except they have different metadata, and it's still going to return true for an equality test. 